Netag Mon. I'm a postdoc at Jeff Buka's lab, and I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work today. And I'm going to talk about human to yeast pathway transplantation, cross species dissection of the ADNI de novo pathway regulatory note. Pretty long. Um, okay. So the pathway that we chose to do the transplantation with is the Adni de Novo pathway, which is marked here in purple. And it's, as you can see, it's part of a larger pathway that is actually the network of the purine biosynthesis network. And this network actually connects to quite a few metabolic pathway. But I'm going to tell you, like, the end of the story now, which we found out is that the most important regulatory node in this is the is PRPP and its connection to the other uh, metabolic pathways through catalyzed, catalyzed through uh, AD4 in yeast and PPAT in human cells. Um, so when we go about humanizing a yeast, humanizing a yeast pathway, um, I just want to note that this was done before the age of CRISPR in our lab. So it probably could have been done a lot faster now with CRISPR, but this was done before. So the way we humanize pathways in Jeff's lab is that we um, express the human, the human genes under their yeast promoter and terminator. So they were, the yeast promoter and terminator we count as 500 base pairs upstream and 200 base pairs downstream. They were amplified by the awesome power of undergrads, like Jeff likes to say it, um, by the Build a Genome Parts Library in Johns Hopkins. And uh, human genes were uh, code and optimized by several companies to, for expression in yeast. So we put all of them on one neochromosome, uh, and we transform it into yeast. And the first step to see if this actually can work, this neochromosome, was to check each of the single gene deletions in yeast and see that the neochromosome can complement, which means that these yeast strains which are ad strain can actually grow on media without adenine. And as you can see, the neochromosome does complement all of them. So the next step in humanizing a strain will be to delete all the yeast strains, because we wanted to work only on the human strains. So this took about a year. And again, this would have taken a lot less with CRISPR. And the reason it took a year, because I did it sequentially, one gene at a time, uh, with two lab moves in the middle. So this is why it took a year. Um, and we, uh, by taking a URA, URA marker, putting it in instead of the gene, and then deleting it so you can use it for the next step. So this took about a year. Making the neochromosome took about two months. So this was the bottleneck of the pathway. The next step was to put them together. And now we have a strain that has, that has the adenine de novo pathway working for only human genes. And ta-da. It looks like it works. Um, we can grow this strain on, um, on media without adenine. Um, the story could have been very nice and very complete at this point. However, when we took the cells and actually locked, looked at the growth rate in media without adenine, we saw that there was a significant difference compared to wild type. So they grow a little slower. And to figure out which of the genes is the problem or multiple genes, we took, again, a single deletion and did the growth assays. And you can see that most of the problems occur with AD4. OK, AD4 is basically partially complemented by PPAT, which is its human counterpart. Um, so the next thing, we, the st next step, step we took to, to try and figure it out was to do overexpression, what you would do like any yeast geneticist would do. And unfortunately, uh, overexpression did not work in this case. We did integration, we did a sand plasmid, we did um, two micron plasmid with a very strong promoter, still look exactly the same, partial complementation. That led us to understand that this probably is not due to transcription, but rather due to some problem, enzymatic problem with the protein. And I will make a very long story short uh, by telling you that um, we found a few, there's, there was a lot known about this pathway in yeast, um, but we found a few additions to that. So one of the things that was known was that there is a positive 
feedback from meta metabolites downstream in the pathway that causes overexpression of the genes um, of the gene upstream. And then we also there was also known that there is some um, there is an allosteric inhibition of the protein by uh, by the products of the pathway, which is IMP, IMP, and GMP, that bind to PPAD or AD4 and actually inhibit its activity and inhibit the binding of PRPP. But what we found is that this binding actually caused the degradation of the protein. Um, and how did we figure it out? Is that by tagging the protein and looking at the expression of the protein. So when you look at native, uh, the native gene with the native promoter, um, you see that there's a lot less PPAD versus AD4. Um, to decouple the transcription effect and the protein expression, we used an estradiol inducible promoter. And as you can see, when you grow the cells in media without, without adenine for a long time, you can see accumulation of the protein. That led us to believe that this is, that the binding of nucleotides to the protein actually induces its um, its degradation. So we wanted to see next if this is intrinsic to human versus yeast or it's something that's more, that's more spread through the tree of life. So first we chose about 20 PPATs from different organisms and you can see that they cluster, which goes well with our hypothesis that this is, has to do with the level of, um, of the nucleotides in the specific organism and you can see that um, depends on kind of the lifestyle of the organism, they have the same complementation to add four. And because Jeff is not satisfied with 20 PPATs, we actually did 70 PPATs from all over the tree of life, and we saw a similar result. You can see that they're still clustering. There's some, um, some that are uh, not really um, having the same pattern, but I'm not going to get into it. Um, but we basically see the same pattern. Um, another interesting finding from this is that we saw that in some cases there is something called crossfeeding, uh, which you can see here, which basically means that a, uh, a strain that can grow on minus adenine actually secretes purines to its environment. And if anybody of you are familiar with the disease called gout in human, Gout, this is basically a model for gout because this is similar to what's happening in gout where uric acid accumulates because of increased production of purines. So this is potentially could be used as a model for um, gout in yeast. Um, so this is basically a summary of what I told you. So we humanized a metabolic pathway in yeast. Um, there's a lot more details that I couldn't go into today, but you can come and ask me. And I also showed you, we found out a few things about the regulation of the pathway, and we found out that uh, this might be a good model for gap in human, in yeast. Um, and I just want to end by thanking my collaborators, so that probably without them, this would have taken five more years to figure out. And um, all the Buka Lab, and thank you for listening. Well, first of all, to see if it's possible. And then the second thing is you can use it as models for diseases that are associated in different pathways. You can, first of all, we saw that you can learn a lot of stuff by doing it about the regulation. But you can also think about using it as a model for um, diseases, human diseases that are associated. There are quite a few with the salvage pathway. There's quite a few diseases that are associated with it. And you can use it, you can pos possibly use the yeast as a, to, for drug discovery. Thank you.